Well, we are sorry we are a bit late. Um, I'm really delighted to introduce Professor Andy Whiten. Um, he studied zoology in Sheffield, and then I got, he got the PhD in Bristol University. And he has been also a postdoc fellow in the departments of experimental psychology. He moved from zoology to psychology at the University of Oxford, and then moved to the School of Psychology at the University of St. Andrews, where he has been um, lecturer, reader, and then professor from since 1997, I believe. Mm -hmm. And then since 2000, he's what law um, professor of evolutionary and developmental psychology. He's founding director of the Center for Social Learning and Cognitive Evolution, and founding director of the Living Links to Human Evolution Research Center. His research focuses on evolutionary and developmental analysis of social cognition, particularly social learning and culture. Developmental questions, um, he address, addresses developmental questions in his studies of children and evolutionary uh, questions through his studies of non-human apes and monkeys, both in the wild and in captivity. Um, he has, I mean, he's very well known for, I, I would just single out a couple of um, really important contributions to the field. Uh, one is he's one of the proponents of the Machiavellian hypothesis um, that uh, probably we will address it um, tomorrow in the discussion. And he's also and the author, or one of the co-authors in any book or book chapter on uh, culture from a comparative perspective. He's an elected fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, um, also a fellow of the British Academy and the International Cognitive Science Society. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay at the back there? The microphone's working okay. Sounds okay here. So, um, yeah? Sorry? If you're going to be here, you will be out of the camera. Uh, where do you want me? Okay. Yeah. I need to be on camera, it seems. So. We wouldn't want to miss that. Um, OK, well, so here's what I'm going to uh, talk about. Um, and as you can see, there are two concepts there in the first line that I'm going to focus on, conformity and over-imitation. And I'll be explaining more what those are. Um, but I think one thing they share is that they're both strong or potent forms of cultural transmission, and therefore, they're very apt topics to talk about in the heading of uh, culture and cognition, the topic of this meeting. However, in the literature, they're rather separate. There are quite significant literatures developed over recent years about what's come to be called over-imitation and another one about conformity. And what I want to do in this talk is try and bring them together and show you what they perhaps share and how they fit into a kind of global uh, bird's eye view about cognition and culture. Okay, well, in some ways what I'm going to talk about is, is relatively narrow, in some ways I suppose more so than the talks you heard about this morning, which I think were very wide-ranging. I could have given a more wide-ranging talk, um, and so because of that I'm, I'm just putting up a couple of uh, recent publications that the students among you, if you want to know, well, what would be a broader view from Whiten? Um, here's one that's a review of social learning traditions and culture, the whole bit, uh, across primates in this, this new book, The Evolution of Primate Societies, which is pretty much the descendant of primate societies, which was the Bible of primatology for a couple of decades, really. Um, but then if we focus in on chimpanzees, here's a paper 
that again addresses the whole scope of culture in chimpanzees and humans, covering some of the same ground that Mike Tomasello did this morning, uh, but also using that to look at some of the similarities that allow us to recreate or understand the ancestral foundations of the uh, rather special culture that we humans have. So uh, there's a couple of references to those, and I've brought along, as I often do, this listing here of our recent publications. So if any of you want to be uh, delving into that, uh, there are some copies along the front here, and you can pick up uh, one of those later. The two topics I'm going to talk about today, funnily enough, uh, I realized as I was starting to put together the talk, uh, are for me a kind of 10-year story, because for each of them there's an origin paper which goes back to 2005. So here they are. The first one is about conformity, as you can see, and I'll, I'll describe that more in a moment. That's based on experimental studies with chimpanzees, uh, but we've since followed it up with, with similar studies with children that I'll mention later. The other study... Um, about causal knowledge and imitation emulation switching doesn't actually mention over imitation and that's because that was really I would say the discovery of the phenomenon in, in work with Vicky Horner and myself um, but it wasn't until a couple of years later that it actually got labeled by someone else as over imitation and you'll see why and I'm going to start with that and dive straight into uh, the empirical uh, work so we're going back 10 years to trace this history Here's um, what the paper was called, Causal Knowledge and Imitation Emulation Switching in Chimpanzees. And the reason we were doing that was that it was a very uh, topical issue at the time, I would say it kind of still is in certain quarters, as to what is the nature of social transmission in chimpanzees or other non-human primates compared to humans. Um, and part of this very much uh, relates back to earlier work by Mike Tomasello. Mike, when he talked this morning, contrasted two things in his first slide. I think there was social transmission or cultural transmission and cooperation. And it was cooperation he then wanted to focus on, parking to one side cultural transmission or social transmission, anticipating that maybe some of us would pick that up. Well, that's exactly what I'm going to do. My whole talk really is about these two particular forms of cultural transmission. And some research had suggested that um, there was one particular form of social learning which might really uh, brought out and, and pushed to the fore emulation, um, which superficially may look like imitation, but all that's happening there is that the individual doing the social learning is benefiting from seeing the results of the other's actions, and then they recreate that. And of course, if they happen to use the same means, because they're the same species, it might look superficially like imitation, but isn't. And then there's imitation, which is actually copying the actions uh, themselves. And something of a debate had arisen between our inferences from what we've seen that, in fact, chimp both chimpanzees and humans perhaps do both of these, um, and other research, including very much, I, I guess, pushed by Mike, <laughs> Mike uh, saying, no, there's a real contrast here. Um, and people like Claudio Tenney uh, continue to strongly adhere to that notion, and that perhaps that's a very importantly at the basis of the huge difference in our cultural transmission abilities between humans and other primates. We thought, well, maybe, no, there is some flexibility here. So we did this experiment in which there were two conditions. In one condition, either a young chimpanzee or a young child uh, would see what's going on at the top here. They would see a familiar human caretaker take a little stick tool and then, first of all, open up a hole at the top here by removing some of the defenses and then take that stick and push it in several times like that quite vigorously, then take it out and then uh, open up another hole at the bottom here in, in various different ways, stick the stick in and pull out a reward. It would be a little bit of food for the chimpanzees or a sticker for the children, which for children seems to be just as good. Um, and then, then it's your turn the child or the chimpanzee, and you can imagine, well, what would you do? What we predicted was that you, as a human being, would see all that, it's all rather opaque, but you've seen that works, so what are you going to do? You're going to run through that whole sequence. You're a, a grand imitator. However, what if instead um, you're in the other condition where it's exactly the same box, but 
It's totally transparent. In the transparent version, what you see when that stick goes in the top and hammers down a few times is that there's actually a false partition in here, which you can't see in the opaque version. So when that happens, you can just see, using your folk physics, that, well, that can't really affect the inter interesting and important stuff that goes on below in the box. And so we thought in that condition, you'd see a more emulative response. Okay, so in the opaque one, more of a complete imitation of everything you've seen because it's opaque. In the transparent one, an intelligent imitator, if I can put it like that, an intelligent copier, is going to miss out the irrelevant actions at the top, okay, and just go for the ones at the bottom. And so we thought, well, that's what an intelligent copier like a human being will do. The interesting thing then will be what the, the chimpanzees do. So um, what we've got is a situation where they get three goes on the opaque one, and then they got three goes on the clear or transparent one. And this is what we'd predict uh, in the strongest case, that for the opaque one, they would do the actions on the top, and then as soon as you shift to the transparent one and they see, oh, you don't need to do that, uh, they would shift to just starting with, um, in the transparent one or the clear box, uh, which doing the actions at the bottom. So that's what we predicted, and indeed, that's broadly what we found, not in the children, but in the chimpanzees, because there's the pattern. It's not a complete imitation to begin with, but quite strongly with the opaque box they'll start on the top but then here you've got this step function which is a significant effect where once they get the transparent one they shift flexibly so they're actually being what we describe as quite intelligent copiers in that just showing that flexibility but the children were the group that really surprised us because we're predicting the same thing again of course but what did they do they just copied everything in a kind of blanket fashion. So even, and we boggled when we were looking at this, let's see that videotape again. You know, they've seen this uh, irrelevant action here, and yet they just keep copying it again and again. Um, and that wasn't because they developed a habit. You know, if they start with the transparent one, you see the same effect. So what's going on there? Well, you might say, well, who's, which is the intelligent species here? We were really quite surprised that the children appeared to be, if you like, so mindless in their copying. And I was talking uh, to some <coughs> of you at lunchtime about this, and they said, oh, do you know the expression, if I can get it right, imitamonus, okay? Imitate like a monkey means mindlessly copy everything. Well, it's the reverse. <laughs> it was the children who were the imitamonus. Um, <laughs> and the apes who didn't simply ape everything uh, mindlessly. So that was a very curious uh, effect. Um, and we found over the next couple of years that developmental psychologists become quite uh, excited about this and said, oh, we need to study this, what's going on here? And one group in particular, Derek Lyons, working with Frank Keel, came out with this paper in PNAS, in which they first of all replicated our result with a, a box, you can see it's a bit like ours, the transparent box, and a couple of other things as well. They uh, found the same effect. So by comparison with the baseline data there in white, the over-imitation effect, as they then called it, um, is the one in black. Whoops, let's go back. So they were the ones who then named it as over-imitation, which we could express as reproducing even these visibly, causally unnecessary elements in an observed performance. And that seemed a bit of a puzzle. <coughs> well, one of the things they tried to do in a training study was say, well, can we change that? Surely we can get children out of, of behaving in this uh, so, somewhat silly way. Um, so they first of all had a sequence of, of uh, training episodes where they did some things that were necessary and then some things that were clearly unnecessary, like so they were opening a jar, and before they opened the jar, they would take a feather and scrape it down the side of the jar. And then they would say to the child, and of course, you know, which, which, which actions did I not have to do, which was silly and unnecessary. And, and children seemed to recognize that. So they had several episodes like that, and then they tested them again in the standard setup. Same effect. So they then did another training study, which they went even further. And, you know, they really tried to teach the children or tell the children, don't do that. I want you to watch really carefully, because when I open this puzzle object, I might do something that's silly and extra, just like the, the feather they'd seen in the training. Finally, remember, 
Don't do anything silly and extra, okay? Only do the things you have to do. So, but again, the children did the same. And they even did the same when uh, Derek Lyons uh, went off to one side and said, oh, I just need to um, do something over here. Could you set it all up again, ready for the next child? Um, And then um, the children... uh, did that uh, in order to, to, to get it ready, they, they replicated the whole thing again, even though apparently there was no one watching them, Derek Lyons, but I'll come back to that. So their conclusion was this expression, an automatic causal encoding that's going on here, which I think is um, clearly an interesting, possibly fundamental idea if it were the case, linking cognition and culture um, in our species, that children are almost not able to help themselves in seeing what an adult does, even when they can't understand you know, why they're doing X, Y, or Z, just do it, um, blanket, copy. Well, that was in kind of three and four-year-olds, and so our next question was, yes, okay, but, but when did children grow out of this? Surely, you know, they're not going to do this forever. Let's look at older children. Well, we started looking at three-year-olds, and in fact, we looked at, uh, we watched them um, seeing uh, a live performance or a video one or a control, and here's the transparent in light color and the opaque in dark colors. You see, it doesn't make any difference. The video isn't very effective with three-year-olds. But then when we did it with five-year-olds, seeing, so do they now do it less? No. To the contrary, they do it even more in the sense that they'll even do it when they're watching it on video. So there's no social interaction involved here. They're just seeing this demonstration, and then what do they do? They show a really quite strong over-imitation effect. And further, Mark Nielsen started doing this and doing it cross-culturally because there was a notion here that, well, perhaps you see this in our culture where parents are spending a lot of time encouraging children to copy everything they do and, if you like, encouraging them to imitate everything, and children feel, well, that's what I should do. So they went and tested Bushman children from the kind of uh, society that, that um, Rob was talking about this morning, uh, from who'd been recently hunting and gathering, uh, certainly a very different culture, where the story was that parents aren't kind of directing uh, children in those kind of ways, but they still got uh, very much the same effect. So we decided to... We have this expression in, in, in English, go for broke. Um, we thought, well, let's test adults then. Surely, you know, we adults aren't doing this anymore. So we tested adults as well as three- and five-year-old children, and we showed them either an adult model. So there's Nicola McGigan, my co-author, actually running through these actions that, that I've already described again, or a child uh, doing the same. Well, what do we find we found that the adult was a stronger model eliciting this kind of behavior. But here's the three-year-olds and the five-year-olds. Here's the adults. Are they doing less? I don't think so. They're doing even more. So um, we described this in what was in the title of the paper. Um, I can't remember. Super imitation or something, something like that. Not only over imitation, but going one step further. Okay, and then in the meantime, there have been more of those cross-cultural studies um, suggesting that this kind of behavior does seem to happen pretty much everywhere. Uh, So a huge variety of studies here, including, uh, you know, in in Central Africa, um, people uh, previously described as uh, uh, Aka pygmy uh, populations there. And interestingly, the only population so far in which it's not been found is them, which surprised me because you might think that observational learning, including imitation, would be the strongest in in hunter-gatherers, and that's um, what one might predict. Um, But in fact, uh, so this slide is is from the Burl et al. paper, and maybe it's a bit confusing. The height of these here is the proportion using emulation, so that's doing the opposite of over-imitation, and indeed, they put in here our study from the ones I've just described, showing Western children really not doing any of that. They're fully over-imitating, um, but not the uh, Acker children. However, the Acker adults are. So it, it, it seems that it's just developing more slowly, and there's a curiosity there of why isn't it there in, in the earlier 
phases. But these Ngandu children, for example, at a local horticultural society, we're doing it, uh, as well as the Aka adults. So, um, we're getting this, uh, well, to us it, it, it seemed quite surprising that we're getting to see it in adults. But when you're doing those kind of experiments, you imagine you, know, you as a, a human being com coming into uh, an experimental laboratory, someone does something like with this artificial fruit, then it's given to you, it's your turn. Of course, you're not told to imitate. To the contrary, um, you know, that, that's very much not being said. Um, but perhaps people have an expectation, well, what am I supposed to do? Perhaps you, know, you want me to copy or something like that. Actually, we interviewed people and only a minority uh, indicated they thought that what that's what the experiment was about. Nevertheless, we decided to go ahead and do the final study I'm going to talk about here under the over-imitation heading where people didn't know they were in an experiment. So we did this in an, uh, the Living Link Centre. This is our primate centre of the University of St Andrews that's smack in the middle of Edinburgh Zoo. It gets thousands of visitors who come and look over our shoulders at our primate research. But in the middle of that, we have what we, we created as a kind of science exploration zone where people can uh, have a go at some of the things that, that the primates are working on, such as these, uh, what's called the pan pipes here that um, I'll re be referring to in a moment. And next to it, we put our transparent box, which is just exactly the same as in the earlier studies. We put it there so that this kind of thing would happen. Here are the two researchers just mocking up the way the experiment went. We waited until there was a visitor to the zoo who was coming along and playing with these things and would come to the box next if they just sort of went along the row. And then when they were ready to move along, one of the researchers moved in pretending to be just a member of the public, did all this crazy stuff with the box, including the actions on the top, got something out, laughed a bit. So there's obviously some funny little message in here and then put it all back, reconstituted it. Then moved to the back of the um, room, picked up their clipboard, and there was another person with a clipboard there. They watched what the person did, and then if they did stuff, they approached them and said, excuse me, actually, you've been in an experiment. Do you mind if we actually record your data? So no data was recorded until that point. And of course, I think everybody said yes. There was no problem. So then we recorded the data, and what did we find? Well, we found, again, pretty much uh, the same thing. So uh, here are the, the children results, the control group, um, and the dark bar is they're really working on those bolts on the top plus inserting the stick. Um, and both control groups, you know, that scarcely happens uh, when people just approach it without having seen someone do these actions on the top, then if, if they do see that, both in the child group and the demo group, uh, the adult demo group, then they're likely to do that. So I suppose over this 10 years, I very much shifted my, my thoughts about this to begin with. When I saw these three-year-olds do this, I thought, how stupid is that? What, how embarrassing for our species? You know, can't you get like a chimpanzee and, and make the discrimination? And when will you grow out of that? To now thinking, well... I guess that's what I'd do. Um, well, how should I think uh, not, and what most of you would do, given that's what happens in this experiment? So attention's really shifted to, well, why? And there are various hypotheses out there, one of which is along the lines, one way or another, of the, um, the lion's interpretation, that what you've got here is, is something that we almost can't help ourselves copy everything we see an adult intentionally doing, and there's no reason to think they're in incompetent uh, or anything. We can't understand why, but after all, we are surrounded by opaque objects, uh, as it were, causally opaque objects. We don't understand why people are doing the things they're doing, but they work. And by and large, as a good rule of thumb, if you copy pretty much everything they do, uh, that will lead you in a good direction. Even if it doesn't, if you by accident, as it were, copy stuff that is actually irrelevant, well, you'll discover that sooner or later. And of course, you know, child, human children have the longest childhood in which to experiment with these things, try them out. Um, and of course, adults are not normally, as it were, playing tricks on <laughs> children um, or adults uh, in what they do in the way that's being done in these over-imitation experiments. Other explanations have to do with social interaction, that you're doing this kind of thing in order to form a bond with uh, the other individual, and there are some experimental results that support that. 
or you're actually picking up some, some cultural norm that, that this is the way to behave. You quite understand why, but just do it. Um, and I think that wouldn't apply, obviously, in this experiment here, because people don't know that they're in an experiment. So that's one of the reasons I think this experiment is, is rather nice, rather exciting. This is the one that's not yet published. Okay, so that is um, pretty much kind of a lightning trip through over-imitation, what I want to say about over-imitation, I hope you've now got the idea of what that is um, and some of the lines of evidence, particularly from our own work, but it has blossomed into quite a, a big kind of little mini-industry in developmental psychology. Although, I think it's true that there's still only the one chimpanzee study, that first one, that suggests that chimpanzees are different. Um, you'll see in the literature a lot made of, of that contrast, saying here we've got a special human characteristic uh, doing this over imitation, which we don't see in other species. But in fact, there's a lot of <laughs> evidence now that, yes, indeed, children and, and people of different ages do it, but rather little evidence still that other species don't. So I think that's the one side of this we perhaps need to be cautious about. Okay, so over imitation. What about conformity? What is conformity? Well, one way of looking at what I'm going to say about that is that that's not so easy to say. It means different things in the literature, and some of which I would say don't overlap. And what I want to see is, well, how might they overlap and, and how are they linked together, even if they're only peripherally related? This is a slide I've, I've taken to using to introduce the idea of conformity, and it's, it's rather nice because I hope probably your first impression is there's a flock of sheep. Uh, which are the kind of archetypal conformists. You know, if you're a sheep, you do what all the other sheep do. I mean, that's what you do. Um, but in fact, of course, they're not sheep. They're human beings, um, and they're all doing some strange, bizarre behavior, but they're all doing the same thing, and the notion is, well, why are they doing that? Well, because that's what you do, and that's what everybody does, so i better take my clothes off and do this. Um, I think, actually, it's a work of art. Uh, rather than an actual um, event. But I think we can all imagine kind of things that human beings do where we are this uh, conformist. We just do, do these, something quite bizarre because, well, that's what everybody does. Um, however, it means different things. Um, let's start uh, with, I think, what was the first sort of series of experiments that put this notion of conformity on, on the map in some kind of scientific context, and that was social psychology. Solomon Ash uh, did these kind of experiments where you have a group of uh, individuals brought together in a room and they're all asked in turn to make a judgment, a very simple one, which is something like this, for example, there's a series of lines on the right, which one on the left matches, uh, sorry, yeah, which, one, which ones on the right match um, the sample on the left? I expect you to probably think it's C. However, um, in fact, in this experiment, there was only one true subject, this poor character here. And all these people are stooges of the experimenter who go around in turn and say something like, it's A, it's A, A, A. So we get to this poor guy, imagine you're in that position, you're feeling a little bit of pressure, um, and you can see it here. <laughs> it's his turn now. What, what are you saying? Um, but a significant proportion of the people in that position conformed. In other words, they, they said it was what all those other people had said uh, before. Well, um, what I want to do is start drawing up a diagram of how these different sort of aspects of conformity and the literature on them uh, link uh, together. Oh, but this is something I want to say before that. Yeah. So what you're seeing here uh, is an instance of what... Um, not only in this area, but uh, other areas, including what, what's generally termed cultural evolution studies, uh, say what we're looking at here is an example of a frequency-dependent bias. Okay, Here, individuals are adopted given behavior with a probability that varies in response to how common the behavior is in a relevant social group. In that uh, Ash example, it was, it was a unanimous majority, but it might just be a majority. And in fact, uh, Kevin Leyland in his paper, in his um, well-recognized paper on social learning strategies in which he differentiated several, one of those he just called copy the majority. Um, so whatever that majority would be of option A versus B, that's what you would uh, prefer to do. 
However, there's a more extreme version of that, uh, which was particularly made famous by uh, Rob Boyd and Pete Richardson, uh, which is generally regarded uh, or described as a conformist bias, where individuals follow the majority but show a disproportionate tendency to follow the majority. So say you're in uh, uh, a, watching a group of people where 70% of the people do option A, the rest do B. You're more than 70% likely to do A. You, you go more extreme. And that's important because, as they showed in, in, in that work and in, in their modeling and so on, that can have very profound effects on culture at large, um, reinforcing intra-group homogeneity and possibly uh, increasing intergroup differences um, correlated with that. So I've started to think, um, and I'm going to fill this diagram out as I go along, well, how do all these things relate together? Um, you've got one notion there of copying the majority. You've got another one of just overriding your personal information in order to be like uh, others. And the ASH experiment seems to be in the overlap between those. So both those things are true. Okay, You're overriding your personal information about, in this case, what's the longest line, because you're copying uh, a majority. And then, the way I've sort of diagrammed it here is where you've got that confirmist bias, which is a subset of that, where you're not only copying the majority, but you're doing so in that exaggerated way. And I should say at this point, before I forget, that you know, the size of these circles is, is just notional. They're not meant to represent in any way, as it were, the significance uh, of, of the effect that we're looking at. Um, it's possible, although I don't think that was um, necessarily Im implied there, that uh, that kind of conformist bias of exaggerated copying the majority could apply in a situation where you're overriding your personal information. That wasn't the way it was set out, I think, by um, Boyd and Richardson and, and their various followers. In other words, that, it was that, that modelling generally was done in a situation where you'd be looking at a naive uh, observers of various frequencies of uh, options like A versus B. But it's a question mark whether you'd get that. You didn't get that in the ASHA experiment. It was actually a minority of individuals who uh, would, would do this. Um, so individuals are not more likely to do this uh, if they didn't see a majority. Um, Okay, well, uh, my own exploration of these kind of ideas was actually quite post hoc to begin with. So um, one of the first studies we did, which was uh, described as a diffusion experiment, a, a social diffusion or cultural diffusion experiment uh, with chimpanzees, was trying to see, well, ha can they support the kind of traditions that we'd inferred on the basis of studies of wild chimpanzees uh, may be happening right across Africa and producing traditions. Can chimpanzees sustain traditions? We investigated that by taking two groups of chimpanzees, the, the blocks there, uh, who can't see each other. We presented them with the same task, getting fruit out of this rather complex, challenging foraging device, using a stick tool to do so, and either training just one individual to do so by lifting the blockage up out of the way with a stick, and so the grape then rolls out. Or an individual here, shown a completely different way, involves poking your stick in, knocking the block back, and, and the grape rolls forward. Well, this experiment was really done to see, well, do we get traditions uh, developing, which we did. I mean, here's a sort of simplified diagram of what happened. Broadly, we got this poking behavior spread across the whole group, um, and the lifting behavior largely across the rest of the group, so a big uh, statistically significant difference, and what you could certainly describe as two different traditions emerging, uh, but there was corruption in each of them, more so in this, this group here. What was interesting then, which wasn't something we went out to look for, was when we looked at them uh, at, at later periods, two months later, we found that the individuals who, as it were, had strayed from what was introduced and shown the, this corruption and discovered there was another way, the other way to do it, were significantly likely to, as it were, return to the fold and do what most of their group were doing. And so at that point, we thought, well, that's rather like the ASH experiment. It's not as extreme uh, as that kind of experiment. And uh, also, these uh, animals are only discovering there is an alternative way to do it, um, uh, and then returning to what the majority are doing. 
Um, but we had a rather similar effect when we studied capuchin monkeys doing something simpler. So here they've got a foraging device where you can either open up a little door like that, but the same door uh, can be slid out of the way. So that seems a rather sort of subtle difference. But if you seed each of those in just one monkey in one group, well, already on day one, those two are spreading differentially in the two groups. We've got a lifting group and a slide group, and they're not getting mixed up between them. And indeed, if we run the whole series over a week, we get two rather convincing different sort of incipient traditions developing, the lift versus the slide. But notice that all, along, all through here, some monkeys, in fact, the majority of monkeys, are discovering you can do it the other way, and that, that works as well. And these ones as well, you can see all the little dark bits mean occasionally they're discovering you can do the other way. And yet, they stuck, as you can see, to the behavior that's commonest in the group. So again, we put conformity uh, in the title of this, but admittedly, we hadn't gone out to study conformity. This was us discovering maybe there's something interesting going on that you might call conformity here. And it was left to others later on to actually tackle that directly and experimentally, or at least in terms of is there a majority effect in chimpanzees? Um, and here's Mike Tomasello coming in again because uh, this was a collaboration of his group, Daniel Hahn, um, in which they showed uh, the following, that you've got a kind of simple choice that the chimps are getting of uh, posting tokens in a, a yellow box here or a blue one or a red one. And before chimpanzees got their go, or, or children or orangutans got their go, they would see either three conspecifics in turn posting in one box, the yellow one, or just one chimpanzee posting three times in the blue one. So it's the same frequency they see overall, but here it's done by, as it were, a majority of chimpanzees, three doing it this way, just one does it this way, and they found significant effects. I don't think I've got the, um, yeah, the graph there, but you can see from the title human children and chimpanzees showed that uh, preference. The orangutans didn't in, in this experiment. And now, um, more recently, we've got some data from the field. I'm going to mention one uh, recent study which uh, is consistent with all that from wild chimpanzees. So this is not um, uh, an, an experiment. It's just what chimpanzees do. Um, and I'm taking this from our... Um, well, the illustration for this uh, from our uh, original paper, 1999, Cultures in Chimpanzees, where we came to the conclusion there are multiple traditions in, in chimpanzees, putative uh, cultures um, uninfluenced or not explained by environment or genetics, one of which is nutcracking, which is only seen in these West African populations here. Here's the illustration of it. Um, even though in some of the East African chimpanzees or central ones, you can show all the raw materials are there, the nuts there, the tools and so on, but they don't do it. Well, one worry about that always is, well, could it be, so if they're doing it over here and not over here, um, despite those materials being there, maybe there's some other subtle differences in the environment you're not picking up. Maybe they've got some other food so they don't need to do it. Or maybe there's some genetic difference between those. You know, these have a kind of instinctive cracking ability and something is deficient in these ones uh, genetically. Um, but one way in which you can go beyond that is to make comparisons between neighboring groups of chimpanzees, and that's what's been done now by Lydia Lunks working with Christoph Bursch group. Um, and her recent paper in American Journal of Primatology follows up an earlier one where what they showed was there are indeed subtle differences in the way the chimpanzees use tools, in particular preferences for hard rock hammers um, in some seasons where other animals who don't need to use them in those seasons because the, the nuts are soft uh, give it up, but others who persevere in them. So there are these subtle differences in cultural approaches to this behavior. Um, and what they found was uh, this. Wait a minute, I think my thing's slipping off. I might need your assistance to get it right or mm, no is that okay yeah okay um yeah in chimpanzees when females mature they are the sex who tends to be uh, the movers between uh, communities in all primates once one sex or the other tends to move in monkeys it tends to be more males but in apes it tends to be females and so you might expect therefore that females would show 
less similarity to their local uh, cultural norm, if we can put it that way, cultural norm in the, in the statistical sense of, of that's what's most common there. But in fact, they didn't find that. So um, here are the data for the females, which are really very similar in the central tendency and distribution to the males. Um, so as they say in the title, there, neighboring chimpanzee communities maintain these differences in cultural behavior despite the frequent immigration of the adult females. The conclusion they drew there being that females are conforming to what the local way is uh, of using these tools to crack nuts. And they followed in this paper just one female so far who indeed moved and continued initially with her way of doing it and then over the course of a year or two uh, converged on the local. And I gather they've got now more which in, in, in papers on the way uh, is reinforcing that conclusion. <coughs> Okay, so, right. Um, so what's interesting there, or one of the interesting things there, I think, is that one's got a context in which these animals are moving from one place they know very well to a different one and apparently conforming to the local ways of doing things. That may be a sense, uh, sorry, a context in which it makes functional sense to do so. You're moving from a place where you know, you know how what stuff works to a location where you may be more uncertain about what's the best thing to do, how to use the tools, what are the right things to eat. And this is an experiment uh, of our own, where again, it seems to happen to me a lot. I do an experiment to test one thing, and then there's something else more interesting happens within it, and the trick is to latch onto that and say, hey, this is something interesting here. And again, it was conformity. What we were doing here was, uh, a study in our wild vervet monkeys where we're observing them and experimenting on them uh, in South Africa. And we've got multiple groups there. And researchers there were already, once a month, giving them a big box of maize corn as a quick way of sorting out what's the rank order between all these monkeys. You give them this box, and over the course of two hours, you see, first of all, the high rankers take it, and then it, it goes uh, along the ranking, and then finally the, the lowest ranking are taking the last little bits. And there's various interesting things you can learn about alliances and coalitions and stuff like that along the way. But what we did here was to divide the corn into two boxes. We dyed one pink and one blue, and we made one of them taste horrible um, by soaking it overnight with, with local aloes. That does, does the trick. So the monkeys quickly tried both of these and quickly learned that one tasted bad. So we had four groups and two uh, we trained that the blue one was good and the pink one was horrible, and two others, it was the other way around. So there's the group that knows, no, it's, it's blue you avoid. So we had two groups trained to avoid blue, two to avoid pink, and we had a lot of monkeys here, there are over 100 that are individually recognized, and the experimental design was to have three one-month intervals where we trained them like that. That was enough to get them to, to know you don't eat that one. And we did this at a stage when well, the infants, because there's a birth interval, are not taking solid food. There's a whole corpus, uh, a whole set of um, infants born who are just still suckling at this stage, or at any rate are not um, eating solid food. And then we took it away for four months and brought it back and then gave them five test sessions in which there is no nasty stuff at all now. So both the blue and pink are equally edible. And we were doing that because our first question was about infants. What do infants really learn as they develop? Do they explore different things and discover what are the good things to eat by individual trial and error learning and so on? Or are they influenced in an interesting way by what's going on culturally around them? So at these five tests here, now the infants, because the vervet infants grow up pretty quick, they're now ready to start taking solid food. Um, that was why we did the experiment. So this doesn't necessarily tell us anything about conformity, but certainly about the potency of social learning. Because of 27 infants, 26 infants just went for what was the local food uh, being preferred. And this one here was the one that, uh, in a sense, uh, confirmed the rule, the exception that proved, proved the rule, because that mother was a very low-ranking one, and all she could do was sort of slip in and, and grab some food, generally the one that wasn't the key one. Um, but of course now it was fine to eat, so she ate some, and her infant ate what she ate. So 
when we include that, 27 of the infants out of 27 ate first what their mother ate. So uh, all we conclude from that is that there's very potent vertical social learning, and that's why uh, we actually did the experiment. But then what happened was, um, fortuitously, that we learned something about what males do who move between groups. We had some males move into our groups. We knew weren't ours because we can recognize them all. But there were ten who moved like this. Here's three moving from an area where they know you eat the pink, don't whatever you do, eat the blue. They're moving to a new group. There's the box. Everyone's eating blue. What do you do? Um, in fact, I've, I've given this lecture a couple of times to a public audience, and I've sort of said to the public, audience, okay, what would you do? Or what, what would you think these monkeys would do? I mean, would you see that everybody else is, is doing this, and, and as in Rome, do as the Romans do, and immediately switch and, and eat that? Or would you stick with what you know um, and avoid this other thing you know it tastes horrible? Or might you initially do that and then start to notice, wait a minute, others are eating something else, I'll, I'll try that. And actually, almost everyone votes for that third option, the kind of flexible one. But in fact, what we found was more extreme than that because the males shifted straight away. We, we had 10, which is just enough to get a, a statistical effect. So here's what those males uh, ate before they moved. The ones at the bottom of those uh, immigrants, we didn't know, so we don't know what they would have been eating before they came. And here's what they ate uh, when they had their first option. Most of them already switch. What was most interesting, I think, or the sort of extreme effect, was when we look at what they eat when they're not outranked, because after all, these males moving in tend to be uh, low-ranking to begin with. They've got to find their place in the, in the group. Um, then as soon as they get, the, as it were, the free choice, they take what the locals are eating. So that's really a quite strong effect, which is why we put conformity uh, in the title of this paper, as well as the potent social learning bit, which uh, referred to the infants. Well, that's um, our monkeys. More recently, just earlier this year, uh, a paper came out, not on primates, but um, on these little birds, great tits, uh, which are living in woods near Oxford. And you can see from the title, uh, conformity seems to rear its head uh, again. Like us, I guess. They were doing this study just to do a good experimental study on the... Um, uh, cultural transmission or lack of it uh, in, in birds like this. Um, and it's on a large scale, so there are hundreds of, of birds who are, are, are marked with little pit tags on their legs so that when they come to a feeder like this, it's automatically recorded who they are, who uh, is, is coming there. And there was a little device there that in each of uh, several communities, two birds were trained either to push the pink bit to the left or the blue bit to the right. So these groups are seeded in that way and what they discovered um, was a rather wonderful, very compelling spread of those behaviours to become different traditions uh, in the first year and then continued in, in the second year after that. But the interesting thing from the conformity point of view was that like us, they had birds who migrated between one group and another sometimes moving from, fortunately, blue to pink or pink to blue. Uh, we've used the same colours uh, as it happens, so we can talk about it in that way. And here's the, the conclusion in red of 14 individuals that moved between replicates with different seeded traditions, as many as 10, 71% changed their behaviour to match the common variant in the new location. So they're putting that down as one of the two aspects of conformity that... They observed here, and again, it's rather nice. So we've got in several studies now which are looking at this, this um, context of migration. But they could also look at what happened to begin with as the behaviour spread across the groups. Um, okay, so, but let me summar summarise so far. It seems from those migrant studies that perhaps what we're getting is those, uh, those cases that would fit in the middle there, as the Ash experiment did, in that these are all cases of the migrants overriding their prior personal information, and apparently doing so insofar as they're moving into a group where the majority behaviour is uh, different. Whereas 
that copy in the majority study uh, fits in the part where you're looking at naive individuals not having to override their, their personal information. But that's how um, fitting it in so far. However, to understand what was happening or to make sense of what was happening as the behavior started to spread, I think we need to probe a bit more about um, these aspects of, of copying the majority. And here's an illustration from a review that Nicholas Cladia uh, and I published a couple of years ago. Um, and this diagram comes, I think, yes, from the Efferson study I mentioned earlier on. And it's uh, the same diagram we've seen from Rob earlier on, where you're plotting against the frequency in the population, what's the probability of actually copying. And broadly, we might say that, well, conformity could be regarded as, as anything in, in these squares here. So once the frequency in the population is a majority beyond 0.5, you're likely to be up in that square there, and that's what you go with. However, we differentiated three, uh, uh, three forms of curve that you might get here. One is the simple linear one, um, so if you, let's say, you know, if you see 70% uh, of the population doing it, well, the probability of you doing it is 70% is or 0.7 probability. Um, the problem about that empirically then can often be, the, well, how do you distinguish between that and what could be called random copying? So if you're wandering through a population and 70% of them are doing option A, and you just pick one at random and copy it, well, you'll get the same effect as this, this linear relationship. On the other hand, you might be actually logging that, in fact, 70% of them are doing this and copying that, and then that would be uh, conformity, but only of this linear kind. However, you could get what we differentiate as hyperconformity, that conformity bias uh, I mentioned earlier on, the exaggerated response. So where you've got 70% of the population doing that, you're more than 70% likely to do it. You go overboard to copy. Um, we thought that's a bit confusing. I know in the, um, the uh, cultural evolution area, uh, that's often referred to just as conformity and defined in, in that exaggerated way. Um, but then that's rather different from conformity defined in some of these other ways. So we said, well, why don't we give a term to that hyperconformity? And some people out there in the literature have said, well, that's really helpful. I really like this uh, way of uh, differentiating these um, uh, another saying, oh, you're making it more confusing because you're introducing other terms. So um, I'm introducing this knowing there's some kind of debate and controversy about how we should approach this. Um, okay, and then the other extreme is that other curve, which is going the other way, um, which we're describing as weak conformity. So again, you know, if you've got 70% frequency in the population, you're still more likely to do it than the other one, but only in a weak way and not even corresponding to th this linear way. And people who describe uh, conformist transmission or positive conformity bias as conformity then describe that as anti-conformity, whereas we're just saying, well, let's just call it weak conformity. Okay, so what we're interested in doing as, a, as something spreads across a population is this curve. And for the great tits, uh, oh. Ah, okay. Before I get to the great tits, right, uh, I was going to mention a couple of studies that we've done probing those differences with humans. Here's one we did also in that primate center, and here we're using this part of the display where we simply give people little bits of paper with interesting questions on and say, you could uh, write, draw us a little picture or write something about what your response to that is, and we'll give a prize at the end of the week for the best one. So we did that just as part of our public engagement uh, exercises. Here's the setup where you can do that. You can post your answer in here. And then we put up 20 of them on this board. And here's the uh, little uh, notices saying how you go about this. So the kind of things you get there is something, well, do you know something interesting about monkeys? So this is for children as, as well as adults. And people might draw a little picture like this, or they might decide instead to write something. So here's the question, how did people come to exist? And we were hoping for some kind of evolutionary kind of answer, which uh, often we got, but then we might get something like that, uh, a different answer. But what we did in this experiment was put up on this board on some days, 20 picture illustrations. On other days, 20 written illustrations. 
and then other days it'd be 50-50 or 25-75 or 75-25% to see what got posted in the box then if it, if it was affected by what people see in terms of a majority response uh, that others are making. And what we found was um, this uh, effect here uh, which is pretty well explained as, as a linear effect, or to the extent there's, there's, uh, there's uh, any curvilinear effect, um, uh, it's going the opposite way to uh, the exaggerated one. So we're not getting hyperconformity there. It's quite remarkable, I thought, that you even get this effect. Okay, so people just look at this display, and according to what it is, it's a very predictable response uh, along this kind of curve. So a sort of impressive conformity effect, we would say, um, but not uh, necessarily um, a hyperconformist effect. And uh, somewhat similar in this study, well, this is a very different approach. This is a study of children, young children, in nursery groups, where what we're doing is exactly the same, or as clear as, 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 clear as we can, um, that panpipe study I described in the chimpanzees, but we're doing it with children. So here's one where we introduce into just one child who knows how to use the lift technique, and what this diagram shows is all the vertical lines are children uh, successively acquiring uh, success in this task, and the diagonal is the first thing they do. So I think you can probably see that already you're developing tradition on the first day of that group doing tending to do the lift option. The other group, who was seeded with a light-colored poke option, uh, they're, they're picking up the other one. But I show this because all those horrible spaghetti arrows between the children are actually tracing what children had seen before they did their first success. Okay, so, um, I don't know, if we pick this child here, had watched an awful lot of other prior things that children had done. So for each child, we could compute how much they'd seen of the two options available there in the group, because there was, there was always n not 100% of one, they, they, they varied. And what we found over the course of the experiment was a close correlation between the frequency you see and what you did. Most children did what they'd seen most, you might say, just to put it bluntly. Um, but what we didn't find was children tending to do the thing they'd seen most uh, in an exaggerated way, and more than that. So we didn't see the, the hyperconformity. So uh, in several of our studies, we're, we're not really finding that effect. So that, you know, there's a question about, well, how much do you see that, or in what context do you see the hyperconformity? And some other studies, and in fact, there's a couple done by uh, people in Kevin Leyland's group, um, uh, in different contexts with children and with adults where he is getting that effect um, and the literature seems to be littered as it were with some studies that do and some studies that don't find the effect. Um, but the birds, in the birds, they did. So um, what you're seeing here is the proportion of option A in, in the group and the probability of adopting that option A. And as you can see from the curve, you're getting that sigmoid curve, which is the signature of an exaggerated conformist uh, response. So something that not always necessarily seeing in humans, you know, seems we w you, you are seeing in this study of these little birds. And so I guess the you know, general point I'm making is that some of these effects are really quite widespread and perhaps really important in different animal populations. However, that study has been critiqued by... Um, Edwin van Leeuwen and Daniel Hown in uh, a little critique called Conformity and its Lookalikes, uh, which is in press at the moment. It should be out any week now, I think, in the next couple of weeks, in the animal behavior in the, the electronic forum section of that, where you can have debates and controversies. Um, and their criticism was actually that um, this proportion of uh, option A in the group was actually the frequency of behavior seen and not the proportion of individuals doing it and they pointed out that those two could, could be two quite different things. I mean, it could be just that you're watching one individual or two individuals, very few individuals doing a lot um, whereas lots of other individuals are actually preferring the other option but they're doing it very little. So that could be misleading they're saying. Well, uh, Applin have now responded. Um, again, that, that's in press, of course, will come out at the same time as, as the critique. And one of the things they did was simply say, well, okay, we'll do it the way around that you say. And quite remarkably, you might say, it's almost too good to be true, um, they get the same effect. 
there's that sigmoid curve when they do it um, in terms of the proportion of actual birds who are doing option A. And in fact, they point out that the two are never really in conflict. In the actual empirical data, there, isn't really, uh, there aren't really occasions in which one thing tells you something different to the other. So they're suggesting, in fact, that birds may well, birds like these, um, may well uh, not necessarily differentiate between them, would find it difficult to differentiate between them, but they always get you to the same effect. Um, okay, well, here's another study, and now we're moving to fish, where there are very few studies, I think, in the non-human animal literature that have this kind of exaggerated effect. Um, and here it is where, in this uh, study, fish had two options for, for feeding. They saw, uh, they first of all learned that one was better, but then they saw different proportions of fish feeding at, at these, um, and where the proportions were, were greatest and going in, in the opposite direction, that was where you got the greatest response, and not in a simple linear way, but in fact you got the most exaggerated response here. So um, a quick survey of, of those results suggests that, um, well, now maybe here you're actually getting some animal cases in the conformist bias section of, of this diagram. Perhaps the fish, according to that, because remember those fish are swapping from what they had learned originally to uh, do something different, maybe even in, in that overlap segment of the, uh, the diagram. Um, our vervets could be in there, in that you remember nine out of ten of, of the, the migrants shifted, which was a higher proportion than was actually going on at the time, because remember the food wasn't now nasty, so several uh, monkeys had started eating the other one, but there was a very strong response. But we've only got ten individuals, so statistically we can't see anything about that. Now, okay, almost uh, finally now, um, let's shift to the right-hand side of this diagram, which is currently empty. Uh, what would we make of, of results which indicate there's overriding of personal information, but not necessarily copying the majority? Well, we can debate what we call conformity, but here's the study uh, that's perhaps the best example of that, uh, one by the uh, sort of doyen of animal social learning studies, you might say, uh, Jeff Galef, Bennett G. Galef, um, is the conformity in Norway rats. Um, well, um, yeah, I'm just going to give you the, the, the summary from the abstract here. Uh, these rats, um, if they've learned either that one food is toxic, actually makes them sick, uh, and another is safe, or that one food tastes good, another is less palatable, so that's rather like our vervet monkey study, uh, they'll ignore their personal experience and choose to eat an unpalatable or presumably toxic food after acting, interacting with demonstrator rats that have eaten that food. So again, we've got this same swapping over behavior. And what was remarkable here, I think, is there were two experiments. In the first experiment, the one rat who changed their attitude towards the food and took it uh, were interacting or, or getting information from just two rats. And in the second one, there was just one rat and yet they got the effect. And that's extraordinary if you think about it. So imagine you're this rat, you've, uh, in one of the experiments, eaten some uh, option, one option of food, which actually makes you sick, literally. Um, and then you sniff the breath of another rat who's been eating that food, and you say, okay, I'll eat it. Um, so it's an extreme uh, response, and again, sort of illustrating the potency of, of social uh, information use uh, in this case. So let's uh, give that the benefit of the doubt and say, well, okay, so where would that fit in? If we're going to call that conformity of a certain kind because it, it meets this criterion on the right, then it would be in that part of the diagram. This is where I want to finally then just make the potential link with over-imitation, the, the phenomenon I talked about in the first part of my talk. Because remember in that, although no one has yet really linked it with conformity, or indeed the literature on conformity doesn't refer to over-imitation, um, it, it would perhaps fall in that part of the diagram. It's similar in that um, you've got individuals who we at least assume, can see that, that something isn't necessary, is not causally necessary. Um, it, it, it's a bit like the Asher experiment. And yet, despite the fact that that's, as it were, staring them in the face, or if you're an adult going through our Living Link Center and part of that experiment is staring you in the face, it makes no sense to be doing that. But nevertheless, 
you do it, you know, the social information overrides your personal information, underlies the potency of the, this kind of cultural transmission effect. So, maybe. And as I said at the outset, a lot is made at the moment of that very first study we did, suggesting that that kind of effect is very much uh, a human characteristic to over-imitate, and not seen um, in other species. We didn't find it in those chimpanzees we studied. But that's still the only study, really, uh, which directly compares. There's just one study I'll, I'll, I'll finally mention that perhaps goes towards it um, and seems to be this kind of effect. But this is in chimpanzees, and it's a study by Bess Price, where she was studying do ch can chimpanzees, do chimpanzees, by social learning, acquire the ability to construct tools, which is something chimpanzees in the wild don't really do. A lot of chimpanzee, what's described as, as, as chimpanzee manufacturer tools, is actually destructive, taking stripping leaves off and, and so on to make a, um, a stripped-down tool you can use for something like termiting. But could they actually learn to put things together? So what some of the chimpanzees were able to do was watch through this window on a video as another chimpanzee put two tools together to make a long tool they could use as a rake to rake in food um, that was placed on this ramp here. And she got a social learning effect. So chimpanzees who hadn't had benefit of that experience tended not to do it. However, there were a handful who did. And the interesting effect here I'm going to underline relating to conformity is that best then, uh, a little later, tested chimps with food back here where you needed to make that tool, but also at closer distances to the chimpanzee, so that in that condition you didn't need to put the two tools together. And what she found was that the chimpanzees who had acquired this by individual learning tended to abandon uh, putting the making the long tool and using that. But the chimps who'd learned it socially by observing others persevered in putting the tools together and then often very awkwardly manipulating them to, to, to bring the food closer to them themselves. It's almost as if they got, again, stuck in this thing they'd seen, and that's what they're going to do. Um, so it's not exactly the same as the over-imitation paradigm, as it were, that I, I described earlier. It seems to be akin to it insofar as you've got that, that, that potency of, of social learning, somehow overriding what you might think intelligent chimpanzees would do, and the individual learning chimpanzees, in fact, do do, abandon uh, following that procedure. So maybe even that goes in that part of the diagram there. Okay, so, um, yeah. I think that's me pretty much done, uh, except what I've done is, you might say, I'm, I've gone through these different kind of senses of conformity and, and also mentioned over-imitation and tried to think how these all fit together. And the reason I'm fixing on them, as I hope is apparent, is that they seem particularly potent um, forms of cultural transmission and therefore relevant to our topic today of, of cognition and culture. But I haven't then, as a result, said, so what is conformity? I mean, is it sometimes one thing, sometimes the other, and what ties them together? So I tried to actually to sketch a definition that, that does, and of course it's a bit of, of that character. So here goes, conformity if you want to put all of this stuff together, a strong disposition to match the behavior or attitudes of others. As revealed in preferences to match majority behaviors or individuals, to be guided by others' choices rather than personal ones, or both, which is where you've got the intersection in the middle. Um, and I think it's important when we're thinking about these kind of definitions, we're using terms here, as we often do in psychology, that are also part of everyday language, like imitation, culture, intelligence. And we're doing this all the time. Um, and then trying to give them a technical definition and write, write this specific definition so that if we're asking the question, well, do chimpanzees do this? Do orangutans do this? Uh, do blue tits do this? Um, we're talking about the same thing. That's really crucial. But of course, unlike what's happening once we have defined it and we're looking at empirical data and actually doing experiments, analyzing the data, and we can answer the question, well, does that species do it, or yes or no, according to how we defined it. We can't go out empirically and discover what is the right definition of imitation, or intelligence, or conformity, or over-imitation. All we can do as a community is settle on um, an interesting uh, definition. 
And some of us, uh, Lucy Applin, for example, in, in their response to the, the critique I mentioned, have argued for this kind of approach, of a kind of broad umbrella, and then within that, noting the different forms this can, this can take. Um, and some of these might be different mechanisms producing the same kind of functional outcome, which, which might have similar effects or different ones for culture at large. Um, and in doing that, as I say, we're often using terms that are in everyday use as well. So the final thing I did was just go, to the diction go back to the dictionary. So I went to the concise Oxford Dictionary of English, which is the one I sort of tend to take. Well, that's, that's it, really, <laughs> if you're going to accept any particular dictionary, the Oxford English Dictionary, but just the concise one. So the definition is pretty neat. And, and here's what I picked out. So conform, form according to a pattern, make similar. Well, you could say, well, that's going to try, apply to anything which is pretty much imitation uh, or any copying. Um, but um, there's these expressions here, adapt oneself, and comply with. Well, then we have to go and look up uh, comply. <laughs> uh, but adapt oneself suggests perhaps a bit more this, this side of the diagram rather than the left-hand side. Um, and here's compliance coming in again when we look at uh, conformity. So if we look at compliance... Um, there we go with that. And again, we have these little things I've just highlighted here, base submission, uh, yielding, which seem to be more the connotation of this side of the diagram of overriding personal information. And this, as it were, conflict or contracts, contrast between individual information and the social uh, being evaluated more strongly, and, and that's what uh, you go with. The one I think perhaps you could say is, that, so, and there's no mention here of actually majority copying as such, which uh, critiques like Edwin Van Leeuwen and, and Howen have said, well, the one thing we all agree on is it's majority copying, right? Um, but that's not there in the, in the everyday usage, uh, usages of it. Perhaps this one here, conforms to a practice or usage, implies that, well, it's the norm out there. Um, so, um, okay. Uh, I think that, that's, that's um, pretty much where uh, I want to finish. Uh, rather than summarizing everything, I think the summary is in the diagram uh, that I've just had up there, and I'm just linking it to these, these final notions. And yet one of these things that these almost totally miss out is the thing that I, th I think Rob was talking about more this morning, that conformity can be to cultural norms which are understood. And, you know, some of the experiments that... Was it, I can't remember if it was Rob or Mike, those showing those experiments like Rokoxi uh, group and so on, that children are protesting and say that's not the proper way to do this. That goes one step beyond these kind of frequency dependent or other kinds of uh, criteria that I've been applying here, which I think are the ones that are getting most purchase in the animal literature. Um, but that's me done. Uh, oh, there's a little chapter. I haven't written about this kind of thing much before. That was a photo first foray into this. Social cognition, making us smart or sometimes making us dumb. So you can see where you know, that's referring to the element of both all these kind of effects where we do things that on the safe face of it uh, look a bit dumb, uh, but actually probably are an important part of our cultural cognition and helping make us um, as cultural as we are. And then, yeah, finally, thanks to everybody who's input to this, uh, this work along the way. Thank you. Any question? Hi. No. <laughs> Has it got a switch on it? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the nice talk.
my question is about innovation, because I was left wondering how can a population then um, acquire new behavior if the frequency doesn't allow for conformity to, to, to work. Are there some individuals that are better models than others? So is it just about frequency? Or is it that some individuals are more, have more influence on others and then one individual innovating can spread the behavior to the others? Yeah, okay. Um, let's think. I'm, I'm not sure, I mean, what... I'm just trying to think if I can think of examples of animal animal cases or non-human animal cases where we could say something about that. One thing that immediately occurs to me is from our child studies, the ones I mentioned with all those, those arrows indicating the information flow through the group, what we found is that most individuals copied what they saw. So most children were social learners, as it were. But, um, and there was conformity of the, the general kind uh, I mentioned in that most children tended to do a behavioral profile corresponding to the proportion of the different behaviors they'd seen. But there was a minority of children, I forget what percentage it was, but it's talking about something like 5% of children who didn't, who did the opposite of, of what they'd seen. Um, and so, you know, by definition, they're really innovators. They're doing something they haven't seen. Um, and uh, some of those innovations were then picked up by other children and were part of this whole uh, sort of array of data on which we could say, well, most children are copying what they see. Sometimes that was the behavior we'd seeded, and sometimes it was uh, the behavior that these more rare innovators had, had input to the system. So certainly for children, the broad picture <laughs> is of conformity, um, but there are, all, there are always some non-conformists, um, and you might say, you know, those are the innovators. I think... Yeah, I, I, I could just mention, let's see, does this really uh, address the same issue? Well, there's an allied one, um, thinking about all those immigrants that I talked about, or the migrants. Um, the effects I talked about there were of conformity. So individuals move from one group to another group, and then they conform to what, what's going on locally. Well, again, that's never going to give rise to new traditions uh, becoming spread um, in, in the same way, so new, new innovations are not going to spread, and yet clearly they must have done. I mean, if we take the case of the chimpanzees, the nut cracking originally must have presumably been invented quite quite locally, and then has spread across hundreds of kilometres of West Africa. It's never got to East Africa, it, it, it seems. And so I think we've got a real puzzle, a really interesting question for all of those of you out there who think. What could I research? What's really interesting? Well, I would say one big question we've still got is what, what flips the switch between those? What, what determines when individuals move between groups and they just conform to the local and so you know, nothing gets spread? Or sometimes something does jump from, from group to group and I don't think we understand that, which I think is a kind of allied question to the, the one you're asking. What we, we do know in chimpanzees is there's a nice study by Nishida and uh, Bill McGrew and, and colleagues in which they logged all the innovations that were being generated by chimpanzees, which was quite a lot, and then um, recording that relatively few of those, really very few of those, had actually stuck and, and got, got transmitted across the groups. Well, part, perhaps to some extent that's due to the kind of conformity effects uh, that, that I've been mentioned, but there may be other explanations as well for some or many of them. Thank you. There's one down here. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the nice talk. Are you all the time talking about positive outcomes? Or have you any study about uh, bad outcomes? And I mean aggression or something like that? Um, I think letters. probably the short answer is we've looked at positive outcomes, you might say, behaviors that are rewarding to the individual, and indeed, they're pretty much all about foraging. Um, <laughs> I was giving this talk somewhere, Robert Seyfarth was there, he said, all these experiments are about food, you know, but animals do lots of other things, uh, like, say, perhaps learning socially about avoiding predators, vocalizations, 
um, and so on. Um, I must, you know, in answer to that, I guess rather than your question, uh, there are, are other studies which I think sort of fit this, this frame of I've been talking about of conformity. There's one nice study published um, in, um, about chimpanzees in Edinburgh Zoo recently where there was one little group of chimpanzees who had another group come in and join them. Um, and people had already been studied their referential communications um, which had a different vocal format to begin with. And then the immigrants converged on, on the local ones. So that doesn't ask your question about negative, um, but at least it says, well, it's not all just this, this foraging behavior, which is probably all the examples uh, I've talked about here. Um, because there are examples in the literature of learning negative things. You might say, if, if by negative you mean things like avoidance. So um, looking back some time, the studies by people like Susan Minica, where young monkeys would learn from the responses of their mothers. Um, negative responses to uh, stimuli to avoid them. Uh, but I guess that hasn't been looked at in relation to questions I've been talking about here of uh, conformity, I don't think. So, um, hello. <laughs> hello. <laughs> Trying to think about what the previous speaker, I mean the previous person in the, in the public, talked about, which uh, sounded a little bit like I'm worried about so much conformity. <laughs> it sounded a little bit like that to me. And going around it, do you think there could be a problem of levels of complexity in the sort of tasks that are worked at in these experiments. I mean, if, for example, in the ASH experiment, uh, people having, wouldn't, have to, wouldn't have had to deal with the length of a line, but instead of a rather more complex problem, any other one, where many more things come into play, uh, would the result have been the same? Would the person still have complied, the only subject there was, would he still have complied to the decision of the others, even in a, I don't know how to call it, more complex it is, um, um, more holistic, uh, <laughs> um, which creates more commitment to the person, not such a thing which is roughly not decisive, Mm -hmm. no. are, you, are, you, are you making a prediction yourself that, no, that no. If, if things are more complex, uh, you're more change. likely to get conformity? I don't know. It might change. And yeah. also in animals. Sure. I wouldn't um, know at all how to work at that, of course, but to manipulate levels of complexity of the tasks. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I can think of something in the realm of over imitation or the limited conformity studies per se that I've been talking about. If you think more broadly about social learning, um, then what immediately occurs to me is, is going back to the, the uh, imitation versus emulation uh, difference that I, I talked about in relation to the Horner and Whiten study. Uh, one kind of experiment we've done is, is ghost experiments where we've tried to get at emulation another way of um, showing not someone actually d achieving the result that's normally achieved by some action, but just making that result happen by, by some manipulation like fishing line or something, moving things. And where that's been a complex task or relatively complex like the panpipes I showed you, chimpanzees haven't learned that just from, from seeing the, the machine work, as it were. It seems as if they need to see a chimpanzee do it and then they, they'll commit to it, as it were, they'll, they'll focus on it and copy that. Whereas if it's a very simple task, like moving a door to one side or the other, then we got more, uh, then we got evidence of emulation. They would see that happen even in a ghost condition um, and, and recreate that. So it seemed that the imitative aspect became more important in that contrast, the more complex task uh, that, they were, that they were looking at. And you might expect that, say, opaque tasks uh, come into that category more than um, the transparent ones. 
I, I don't know. I suppose in a, in a more complex tax, I would expect the subjects to decide for what is better adaptive for them uh, in a very big, uh, in a very holistic sense of the word, so that if the whole population is going to flying towards a fire, they'd fly off. I mean, um, they, they would fly away from it. If it's birds flying towards a fire, there, there could be one flying away from it. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not really <laughs> getting the question. Can I maybe talk to you over, over, the, over the tea? Or do you want to yeah. try again? When I, when I, t I, I'm, not, I'm not talking about difficult tasks, uh, uh -huh. about grading di tasks in difficulty. Some tax tasks are, si are simple, others are very difficult, others might be halfway through. That's not it. I'm talking about the complexity uh, at which they are posed. And the complex ones uh, bring into play an enormity of features, many features, um, 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 n not just sensory features, but cognitive features too, combining them. Now, th the ones that happened in the experiments you showed, to my, from my point of view, they looked simple perfectly beautiful and well thought out, I think, but simple. Problems that were easy, which were um, uh, in front of which the subject wouldn't feel challenged in his or her personality or whatever. It's, it's, it's an well, uh, it's interesting you're, you're saying, saying they're simple. I, I guess I think in the, in the animal experiments, the non-human animal experiments, by and large, people are trying to create uh, tasks that are about as challenging as, as the animal can, can cope with. So <laughs> the very simple one you saw, you saw with the little birds, um, you know, that, that's one of the most complicated things that they, they, they've found to do so far, okay. but they could get more complex. In our case, I suppose something like the panpipes, um, you know, is, is what counts for us, or nutcracking, we've done experiments with that as well, which is by and large, you know, if you're looking at wild animals, the most complicated acts being done. Anyway. Perhaps we could continue tomorrow. Sure, sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, we'll, well, we'll talk now more about <laughs> <Okay, thank you. laughs> <coughs>